immerse as miracles in grave. You should stutter when you say that. <laughs> There's an immersion that's analogous to the aspect of terror that's ink on parchment. It stains the parchment, it's an immersion. Yet, there's something deeper than that, and that's chukah satayra, the chakika, the, the letters of Torah that are engraved. So the Ten Commandments is being etched and engraved in a miraculous way. The mem stuma that we've spoken about at length, the letter mem in Hebrew, welcome. And the samach had a hole in the middle and they floated with a miracle. And all the letters could be seen from every direction reading the same way, as if they could be read from all six um, perspectives. Which is also re representing something that's permanent and something that's solid and eternal. So we have the Ten Commandments, the two commandments of which we heard from Hashem's mouth, First two, Anechi Avayli Kachol and La Yielchol. God introduces Himself and says, "You're not allowed to have any diminished concept of divinity. You accept that as your more limited mindset. You have to uh, revere that truth." Um, and those are said to contain the entire Ten Commandments, and by extension, two times five, or two times ten, um, you get every, all the other mitzvahs are derived. So there's, a, a, there's a, an idea of inclusiveness, and it reflects different dimensions of consciousness. Um, here you have, you could be in the world that you have no relationship to the world, so you're not immersed at all. It's not even like ink and parchment, and that's reflecting, ref reflecting the idea of um, a veering from course. Whereas an even deeper expression would be that it's engraved into your very fiber and your being. In a miraculous way, I think the suggestion here is the point of being immersed in something and to looking into the written world words of Torah and seeing how they're derived from something that's engraved and essentially you have within that um, one mitzvah the mitzvah the paraduma the red heifer which the burning of the red calf with, and to make the ashes, and you and you mix the ashes with water, so you have fire and water coming together. You sprinkle it on the the people who came in co come in contact with the dead, and they are now ritually cleansed. They can go into the holy temple and eat holy foods if they're a kayan, etc. So that mitzvah is the entire purpose of this mitzvah is to show how there's a healing and a sort of cleansing that comes about through the recognition of a rhythm of these two things. There is a fire, there's a force of fire, the element of fire, and there's an element of water that both come together in one mitzvah, because you mix the ashes into the water. Water is, becomes um, reverence, whereas fire is love. When you get, when you have a love, love you get close and that closeness causes reverence and you have a, a rhythm the point though is to recognize that they're both etched in miraculously into one into one foundation so you see in the paraduma the red heifer this rhythm played out that there there is really a unity between these two forces and that recognition heals in a way that um, the miraculous 
etched out new you that is a permanent you in the sense that there, there is no falling back. It's all now going forward. If you understood that there's rhythms in life, you can see them as both coming from the same musician. If we just were completely abstract, there would be no definition and no, and no story to experience your life in. So if you want to connect to a, um, a source that connects everything together, you recognize that the story that the author, God, paints in the world or, or narrates into being is um, to have um, the deepest possible connection. It, it's like the guy from the, uh, that, um, that movie that's like just part of the code in the background. And he recognizes, wait, I have a purpose too. I wanna learn this entire mimer with you because it's so good. And there's so much here. I want to do it pretty quick, but I think that's where we're, where we're going with it. It's about immersing, immersing yourself into um, something accessible in the, in the Torah. The, the 613 mitzvahs are right, I, 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 you're able to, do, every time you don't eat an ant, chocolate covered ants, welcome, or frog's legs or, or escargot, you're doing an incredible mitzvah. Just now you did the mitzvah of not eating that. It's, it's very easy to, to always do certain things. Um, and that's a way to connect in everything. Okay, so you, Evelyn, welcome. We're gonna sit down and learn something from Lakute Tenro. I wanna, <coughs> I wanna do it from the beginning. I wanna go <coughs> fast through the beginning because I've mostly been introduced. And also we're gonna say that these two worlds, this rhythm, this Ratz of Ashev, is also mind and heart, and how you're supposed to weave that together, those two opposing world, worlds, the fire and water, how could they come together? They come together when you realize that there's a rhythm. So a narrative is always the beginning, middle, and an end, because it exists within time. And the same with a painting, like a Jackson Pollock has a rhythm because you look across the page. In Israel, you gotta look or the other direction to read the story. And in China, it's, it's probably, or Japan rather, it's probably up and down. The haiku is uh, up and down, it's vertical. Okay, so we are setting out to learn what is this elusive paraduma, the red heifer, that uh, even Shlomo Mamela couldn't understand. Only Moshe Rabbeinu had an insight into what the red heifer is all about. But here the Alter Rebbe spells it out in such certain terms that this is the whole thing it represents, as if there's no secret here at all. I'm telling you today, you can just open a book and find all the answers. So Hashem tells us, this is the decree of the Torah, so Havaya commands this chuk, this chayk, rather, um, the decree of the Torah, it becomes representative and aspect of every mitzvah that's like a decree, something without any meaning at all, just because it's a way to get close to Hashem. It's a way to get close to, to Hashem, to recognize that the model for the chayk, the, on, the only thing that's particular about it, is that it has its own flavor of being it's seemingly arbitrary, but th therefore expressive of something that's at the core, the gerol, the, the lottery of life. So every mitzvah is like that, but there's one that models that because it most obviously shows you how there's these two forces, fire and water, 
are coming from the same source, from the um, engraven in the Torah. B'tzarik l'havi d'ak siv t'chilov y'dabr havaya sh'kadosh baruch hu m'dabr l'meisha z'ayz chukas ha-teira yim ken ma'u asher t'siva havaya If it says in the third person and God spoke to Meisha telling him and it, and it says and it goes on to say asher ani metzavech cha as I command you who is the narrative who is the narrative speaking about if not God's four letter name havaya isn't that the one who's speaking. So what? It's so why is Hashem sa- saying in third person, and Havaya said to Meisha. So there's an aspect of divinity that transcends God's name, Havaya. That is the Ani, the one who says, "I." God re- is the really the only one who could put a capital I, because everyone else is just an, an extension of that. Gam lahavin ksasi in paraduma. The model for what I just said is the letter yud in Hebrew. So also to understand a little bit. Okay, so this is not the whole meaning of the paraduma, which Shlaim Lahemela, King Solomon, could not fathom. Shenem arba chukas That it's said regarding this particular mitzvah, the red heifer, the cleansing of impurity from contact with the dead. Um, is defined as the chukah of the Torah, the decree of the Torah, the chakika, the engraved core aspect of the Torah. It says that the Torah is called written because it says that God spoke and Meisha wrote. He was taking down the minutes of the meeting of the, this meeting with Hashem. And Hashem is therefore able to speak to the rest of the world. It was Moshe probably didn't need this for himself so much because he had a pretty close, tight relationship with Hashem. But in order to make this un- encoded in a way that everyone can approach, and there's ways to approach it, there's laws governing our, the way we approach the, the Holy Temple, which houses the, the Ten Commandments, there's a way. There's a way we dove into Yerushalayim, where it's probably someone underground in the Raiders of the Lost Ark down there, or the Vatican, one or the other. Take your pick. It, it, as long as we get it back to its rightful place. Gam lahavim ksas inin paraduma shenemar b'chukas terach inin dehine terach. So the Torah is a narrative that's written. Bedivrei sefer nikra terach valpeh. Okay, so that authorship from Hashem is spoken, which is reflected in the way there's an interpretive element to the Torah called the oral tradition of the Torah. You see how it takes on this even a higher level than Moshe writing it down, because Moshe is writing down what Hashem spoke. So here we are speaking as if we're Hashem in an interpretation in order to convey an, an aspect of Torah that here is on par with the very authorship of Hashem speaking, narrating the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, to Moses. Amnam chukas ha-Torah lashen chakika, but there's a deeper aspect of the Torah that's not um, narrated, it's ingrained, it's etched in. That's Terah at its very source. So God had to speak the Terah, Moshe wrote it, but that had a source that comes higher from God's name, Yud Kivavke, I think that's where we're going with that, Kabbalistically, but rather the, the one source where everything comes from, even God's names. God's names are the way God relates to the world. So the, the letters Yud Ke Vavke are um, signifying a process of concealment and communication that happens through creation. So Yud Ke Vavke is, is essential to the, our notion of God as creator, but there's a deeper aspect of Hashem that is beyond a narrative that can unfold in the creation. It's this etched eternal um, source.
that everything um, stems out from. Even, even God's words said to Moshe in the five books of Moses. So there is an aspect of Torah that is engraved, that is higher than written on parchment. The written word is not as um, original as the these etched letters. It's, it's, you think the opposite. You think that something crystallizes more as it has its life. But here we're saying there is this crystallized um, source that represents the unity of everything, the, the, the origin of everything. You have a white parchment. You dye it with ink. So the ink becomes something that's foreign to its... So you have two things coming together in one. That's not the case when you have the Ten Commandments engraved in, a, in sapphire rock. So that is something rather that is foreign. A foreign body just basically stuck to the to the parchment. They could they could actually fall off. I don't know if it even dies in much. When I say immersion, I don't I don't really know. It's not physics or or uh, calligraphy how that works. We'll see. It will probably explain a bit. It had no connection with the parchment before this. The ink sat in the ink well, you know, with the stylus and the feather. <laughs> and and there's the parchment rolled out in front of you. It's just after you write them, then they become one. Okay, so now we see there is a type of immersion that happens here when you when you scroll along on the parchment. They become one. Whereas engraved through and through is one thing that's not one thing. So it, the, usually this is talked about in terms of the way light passes through something. And there is some infraction where you ingra- when you engrave and reflection, the light gets affected. So it's not, it's also an expression of the, the core as opposed to the core itself in, in some respect here. We're not, it doesn't mention that yet, but, um, it also relates this to the letters of the soul that are also on these two levels. And this is why the Torah says, this is the decree of the Torah. That's by saying that this word, this word decree, which also means to engrave, chakika, it's a similar word, is um, symbolized by the, the mitzvah of the paraduma, the red heifer, which is a decree. There's, it's just arbitrary rules, decrees from the king, that why red, red heifer? Okay, there's, there is a, the allusions that are significant that even Rashi brings down is the, the simple meaning of the text. It's usually the paraduma is mysterious because it, it takes, it has opposite, seemingly arbitrary um, positions like regarding contact with it and does it render and contaminating the one who renders it. And if it's not used for its purpose, it has a different function. It, it, there's so many laws governing governing it that you could see how th- this is very particularly de- decreed to be that way. So this is a mitzvah that draws into the rest of the Torah this aspect of a decree or an engraving. Somehow this mitzvah is engraved with that quality 
of communicating what it is to be the, the, the very source of the Torah, the deepest level that um, defines us and uh, as a way of engraving without anything foreign mixing in at all. The, a, a very pure, original type of um, connection. Tehainu Shebet Terek Shebet Ksav the Terek Shebet No. Oh. Tehainu the Terek Shebet Ksav that means to say that from the written aspect of the Terek Umin Terek Shebet Ksav Yum Shak Gilu Izeh the Terek Shebet Ksav that is meant to be the source for all future interpretation is supposed to have been Planted in, in the, that aspect of the Torah, the, the etched letters of the Torah. Behind the Fisha Mitzvah's Paraduma, so why does the Paraduma express this most? Who call us a Torah? It actually represents the entire Torah. Uh, because it, it teaches us, Torah te- means to teach. The word Torah means to teach. Why is this the mitzvah that teaches that there's an aspect of Torah that is an engraved, an etching, an original source? And for this reason, to implement the Torah, the soul descends from its glorious place in heaven. And goes into a coarse body. In order to implement this, this plan. These laws, this um, this teaching, and that's why it says, which God commanded you all these decrees, and it says you shall do them. So you came onto this into this world in a mission to do these things. And it says you shall guard these decrees. Which the person does, Adam who because the person is the one who makes these activities into mitzvahs, which means to connect. By him saying, "Okay, I'm going to do these things," it really doesn't make much of a difference to the person whether he eats this food or that food. In the long scheme, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter what you have on the menu. It's all going to probably do the, just about the same thing. My son was famously saying in our house all the time that um, it's the same nutrients in a Coca-Cola and a, and a cup of orange juice. <laughs> it's the same, it's the same thing. It's both has sugar. It's going to do the same thing to you. Because when you actually do the, those mitzvahs, then you're drawing on the source from all those mitzvahs, which is this engraved miracle. And that brings life through these approaches in life. And that's why the souls enclose themselves in bodies, taking themselves, descending their consciousness. Because through that experience, this divine mission ends up causing them to experience an elevation. And this behavior, and this, the what results from it, which is to to draw this aspect of the terror into the world, basically a, your soul comes into the world to take what it was one with these these uh, the great uh, divine mind of the terror, bringing it into the world where you have to implement this plan and experience some kind of enhanced state because of that that mission. It's an aliyah, it's an elevation. And that is through Isru Sudalasato, from your initiative in this process. 
as it says, as it says, you shall love Hashem with all of your hearts, etc. How many hearts does a person have? A royal flush. After it says that you shall love God with all your heart, with all, all your soul, and all your might, then it says that these things shall be upon you, that I command you. Very clear, clearly indicating, Rabbi Korf, um, we've had this discussion, that everything is dependent on loving Hashem, or love of what Hashem loves, which is your fellow Jew. It first says, you shall love Hashem, and then do all these things. And in order to cause the terror to experience this elevation, we were, it seemed like we were talking about our own souls before, but here it says, in order to elevate the terror by, by doing the things and then realizing the source for it is, comes from all one place, and it's not like analogous to ink on parchment, the two things coming together, because it all comes from the same place. So the rhythm we're going to see of the mitzvah of the red heifer, the fire and the water that it constitutes, um, shows the common origin to, to uh, which is Isis Hakika, the engraved letters of the Torah. So in order to do this, Shalomai Lubchinus Adam, so, um, you've taken a potential, which is a person, and given an opportunity to enhance himself through something by showing that that Torah has one source as well. Everything in the world has one source, even the Torah itself. And the two conflicting aspects of it, seemingly, like the two different polarities, rather, to be like fire, to want to connect to your source, and to be like water, to take the, the divine plan and put it into action and do Torah mitzvahs. That, in, that elevates the Torah itself. Because the letters of the Torah, their source comes from something higher than the Torah, so the Torah itself. So there's so many particularities to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and how they comprise the, the Torah that becomes the, the way to communicate it through a, a language, a holy language. The source for those letters is more reflective of, of authorship than the way that the letters bunch together to make a story. So that, that aspect of authorship, of, of or originality, allows additional light to shine into the whole picture. The air HaTerah, through the light of the Torah. By lifting it up through the, the light of, the, of mitzvahs, which are physical behaviors in the world, and through the letters of tefillah. So you see more clearly that we actually articulate letters when we pray, whereas um, the light of the, the mitzvah is it's more third person. You know, the, the, It's more like someone's going to tell you a tale about how you reached into your pocket and gave the guy your, a $5 bill. But they're both express, expressive of some sense of the letters of the Torah, that the, that the, that the, the light of the Torah shines through in this way. And these letters of the Torah that precede the Torah, that become the, the, um, the building blocks for this mosaic of, of a narrative, that is the aspect of the engraved aspect of the Torah, which is more original. And therefore reflective of a more essential aspect of divinity. And to understand how is it possible for us to achieve such a, such a thing, to draw on the very core of the, the divine plan to introduce a new light into the world and light everything up. 
וגם מה שייכס עניין זה שהוא שהוא כלל עושה תירו למצווה פרה אדומה, and also understand why specifically the, this particular מצווה is chosen as the one to embody this idea, to say this is the, the decree of the entire תירו, this red heifer. והנה דהנה מבור במקום אחר, שכלל עושה עניין המצווה, הוא שעל ידי זה נמשך לאדם מכינס מדרגס, מה שכסף בחי עשה קדש. So the idea is that the whole purpose of mitzvahs is to allow us to embody a spiritual thing that's happening in heaven, that there's these angels called Chayas Akedish, these holy beasts, the source for our beast comes from these holy beasts, So it's really good to get them aligned. They're, they're meant to teach us. What does a beast do when it's functioning the purpose of lifting up this chariot? Where the form of man, which represents wisdom, so it's, the wisdom now has, is on wheels. Literally. <laughs> the Aifanim are like wheels of this thing. But it has beasts also at the front. It's got, it's like a wagon, sort of, because it's got a, a, a throne upon it. And it's got the sapphire base. Livnat hasapir. So, the entire idea of having mitzvahs is to bring into the world a rhythm that's called, oh my goodness, <laughs> is to bring into the, to the world a rhythm of running and revering. You run, your heart races to it, it to determine what is causing it to beat so beautifully and with such health. God bless all those need, who need a refuah shlema. What is causing this health, this natural rhythm that works with the world, which happens to exist within time, it has, everything has to beat at the right rhythm to fit with the algorithm that God created. So this rhythm, the red heifers we're going to see is the model for this, but we also have a different model that's more as a narrative with characters. Real people that existed in this world, one was called Avraham Avinu, Abraham our father. It says about him, we learned about this at length a few weeks ago, Halaych v'nasaya hanegba, he went southbound, he went on a journey. That's what it says in the, the holy work in Kabbalah called the Sefer Yitzira, that if your heart races, return to one. There's an idea of racing here that reflects exactly what this chariot does, this divine chariot, with these beasts with the man, man's face in the front. So it has more of a, also reflecting um, an aspect of a person that resembles something more um, primal, the beast of the, of, of, of the man. The, the way man relates to the beast is also represented in, in these Chayas HaKadosh. So these Chayas HaKadosh are in a rhythm. They're not always racing. When you get too close, you, you come to revere and you pull away. You, you, you become sent on a mission, is, is the pulling away. So he, there's two terms to describe his journeying. He went and journeyed. And that's this, this rhythm of if your heart races, return to one. So the heart is the bina, the understanding. Welcome, Steve. Good to see you. Imratz Libcha Sefer Yitzira says, if your heart races, what is, what is your heart? That's your understanding that you relate to. What you're not just going through, but what you've reflected on. So it exists more in time than Chochmah is an imposed experience that you haven't been able to even assess yet. It's just happening. Whereas Bina is a nestling of understanding, literally. And that's the heart. Why? What is Bina? 
Bina understanding comes about through meditation. Hispainanus, contemplation. You contemplate divine ideas. Begdulas Hashem, how great Hashem is. Eich ki beyud nivra ahilam haba. And then he specifies, and this becomes a very instructive model of how the authorship precedes even the yud ke vavke, this whole plan of creation that happens through God's four-letter name. The yud nivra ahilam haba, the, the first letter of which we said creates this world to come, this promise of reward for this soul, spiritual journey. Shafilu, which be, uh, it's, a physical, it's more described as a physical journey because the soul was already spiritual and it gets put into a, a physical experience. So it's more of a, we shouldn't say a soul's journey, we should say our body's journey. It would be more accurate. Or a lower, lower aspect of the soul, you, I guess called nefesh. It's our nefesh's journey. The, the part of the soul that interacts with the body. So God takes the first letter of his name and uses that to create the reward, the promise of the world to come. That even the world to come, which is a type of pleasure that is completely boundless, never ending paradise. The Kamaimer Mutzab Dilidaini, as they discussed about the heretic Acher the informer, the idolater, but he was a great sage quoted in Pirkei Avis. So what are you going to do with such a genius, such a, um, someone who brought so much wisdom in the world if he went so far away from the path? What are you going to do? We would said that it's better that he should be judged. 100, 180 years, I believe, in, in Gehenna, in Down Under, scorched for that long in order to experience paradise forevermore. It's better to go through that. They decided, so they put him through that. Nimshach Rachma Eis Aleph. That's only a single letter of God's name. Dekulik Hashim Mamish. And it's the smallest letter indicating that, th- that this means that that entire reward is nothing compared to the divine core. Lagaba Atzmus Ein Seif Baruch. It's better to just get familiar with the sound of the, the word Atzmus. Ein Seif, the infinite divine essence. I don't like saying essence because I think of like a nice cologne or something like that. Or one of those funny things they put it in washings with with the little with with like spices in it. Or like like a herbal tea or something. And that just doesn't cut it for what we're supposed to I don't like thinking about the word core because I'm I'm thinking like how many sit ups are you gonna ask me to do already to, to uh, get rid of the, the beer belly which Canadians are born with. This idea of how all the pleasure that awaits the souls in the world to come and the bodies in the world to come is just a, a speck, a dot, to, compared to in, the, the in, infinity, is, is described in the verse in Tillam. It says, because with you is a source of light. Shebechinas makar chayim ganeidim vayilam haba hu rak imcha because we say it's with you, the source of life, because all the life and the promise of spiritual bliss is just something that's with you. Like, I guess, the way you'd have um, your iPhone. You don't really identify with the iPhone that belongs to your friend. It's just a way to communicate. The chinas tuffel, it's just a, a technology that you have to rely on. It's something... Uh, it's, Peripheral. And nothing compared to the divine core. And when you think about that, if you're laid, which is mavin, which is his spinatus, you the experience of heart is one of meditation. You meditate on how great Hashem is, as we just said. Every pleasure that awaits us is nothing compared to Hashem Himself. And it's just like something like your iPhone. That, and I guess I guess it's in the fine print. It says something that like this, especially compared to how people are so lost in that world, and how it's laughable how little that represents the true meaning of connecting with the author of all that promise of bliss. 
When you think about that, it sets you a lit in this rhythm of Ratz V'shev. Running to Hashem and then, oh, wow, that's pretty intense. Let's come back and it will suffice with like walking little old ladies across the road is our mitzvah. I guess that's an insulting term. I, I, I'm, I have a friend who's very progressive in like knowing social etiquette and uh, what's reflective of sort of a, a subtle toxicity in our thinking. And, and they're the right. Our, the cartoons that we grew up with, with were so violent to get up early on Sunday morning to, to watch Bugs Bunny. You know, how many sticks of dynamite are blown up in that, in that cartoon? And then look, and we're surprised when our kids go off on a rampage when they get really upset. I guess the pixels don't cut it. Blowing up pixels on the screen doesn't cut it when, you, when they get that upset and they just want to make the whole, their whole life experience into a video game. Okay, I think I want to stop there, not because I just said something depressing. <laughs> Maybe we should reflect on that more. Maybe that's what people's heads are. If that's where our heads are, God help us. If, if we don't have enough horror that's naturally coming out from the little tyrants that, the baby tyrants that, that get, go on a rampage and destroy, pe destroy peaceful living for no reason. It's as if they don't have a big enough yacht. They need a bigger yacht. So they take, and, and don't give me the nationalism story. There's nationalism is, is, once you have the internet, there is no nationalism. You have to have nationalism to protect some other guy from like shooting you, you more. But, so you have to have it, it's just a necessary evil, but that's doesn't, not defining humanity. In, in our point, Putin, in our point in history, that doesn't define the human experience anymore. It's, it's a babyishness, it's a, it's a saying, you know what, I didn't have a good life, so here I'm gonna just bring everybody down with me. It's like life is this dream that you can do whatever you want to experiment, like a kid does with burning ants, and when you can take the, micro, the magnifying glass and use the, the sun to destroy. Just because, I don't know, I was born into this world, I don't know, I don't know what these things are. No one told me what they are. I'm just going to crush them because I don't want them invading my house. But even that, whatever little media exposure I had, I mean, compared to today's kids, must it, could it introduce weird ideas into kids' heads? So the power is, you know, the, re I, the reason why I have to stop is just because it's so long and uh, it's, it's, this will take, a, uh, I'd have to have a few more coffees to do this, I think. <laughs> no, that's, we, we would, we would, we would go further. There's just so much going on. Um, so I'm going to have to, I, I like the idea of continuing with one thing to build on something and we really, really understand it together. I think you should be able to have this conversation at your dining room table with your family saying, okay, let's, let's talk about that. that's Tara at our table. Because that's also as interesting as, I don't know, what, what's the sport that's going on this, this time of year? Baseball, Blue Jays. So I, it's important to have a bonding ritual for males that don't have the sensitivity to really speak what's, what's bothering them. So they have this fantasy world where Taking a pigskin and throwing it across the field is, is somehow the, the, the fascination. I've never really understood sports. My brother did explain it. He's very smart, my brother. He explained sports as an aesthetic. To see the... There's an aesthetic to it. Like I guess the Greeks were very into that. And they were pretty sophisticated culture. And, you know, even the intelligent ones saw that athletics as something virtuous. So here, there's an aesthetic to it. And he's telling someone who studied aesthetics in, in university. So it's cool, you can make a bridge from, from a, my, 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 my brother's very statistical and, and legalistic. He's, he's a lawyer, very smart. He used to go under the table and calculate math uh, equations to answer my father when he's quizzing him. <laughs> He'd go under the table, you know, because he was so young <laughs> and he was so... 
intellectually advanced. So the, the, the main idea I want you to come away with from this, thank you. The main idea, the red heifer, is the red heifer is someone who's lit, he's bouncing around, he's brought some a shave, he's on fire and he gets mixed with water and it's really all part of the same, what was that toy called um, that you used to bake? It was like a toy baking set, but I think it actually baked. Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker's Crock and Bake or something like that. <laughs> Sounds like a crock. So the rhythm of the red heifer is not, the red heifer is, is really an unfair um, epithet for it because it's, it should be with the Mayim Chaim, the water, in the Kelly, with the, with the whole cup, the whole procedure. You'll see everything contributes to understanding how this rhythm fits into one vessel. The red heifer, we have to imagine, in his sort of less dignified state of being ashes, mixed with water. It's sort of reflective of the Saita. I wonder if there's a connection. With the, with the Saita, the, the, the potion that the, the Saita drinks. Mixed with water, isn't it? They don't sprinkle it, she has to drink it though. Here's what the, the sprinkling cleanses. But drinking, it some, uh, drinking something that is not the same thing. But the, we have the, the heifer, and we have. Um, the earth of the Mishkan becomes the dust. The Mishkan was a rectification for the Chata Egel, the sin of the golden calf. So there is a connection between the earth. So these, we, we can make that parallel. Uh, someone should publish a thesis on that. It's so pleasant out here with the, with the sound of the rain. It's almost rain out there. There's a lot in this mimer, a lot, and it's very, it's, it's pretty long. I, I did finish it. It's in my bookmark here, left from years ago. Started the next mimer. Oh no, there's a beer. There's, there's sometimes this, they have it like part two. Now I'm gonna explain that all and go, they go over it, all, the same themes with a slightly different angle or more elaborate, deeper sometimes. Never heard what put this way. If you use the word it, and I don't know when you're saying it, because there's a delay, then I'm not going to be able. I don't know how musicians are supposed to play together live. Isn't there some delay or there's a lag? There's latency, like, how do you jam? If you have any sophistication in your rhythm, it would be lost over the, the internet, <laughs> I would think. So the Paraduma is one place where you have the idea that there's a rhythm in life. Yes, yes, there's ink, yes, there's parchment, one's white, one's black. There's two different forces, polarities coming together and seemingly battling with each other. If you immerse yourself in the process, you can see how they become one. So the letters do dye the parchment and penetrate it. But our point in interpretation and in our, in our initiative also is to reveal in that, that that source, that authorship comes from a deeper spa space even than one of speaking and hearing or sp speaking and dictating and, and taking writing it down, but one where um, from the same place what set it all in motion, which could introduce the new light to make the, uh, the, the way we're engraved, the things that are really the heart, the, 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 why did it have to be sapphire? It could have been like a pudding. Why did the, the Ten Commandments have to be a, something hard? It's, it's supposed to show um, permanence, 
like an essential element that that's visible and takes up space. Not like fire. Where, where do the water and the fire and the earth, wind, and fire go? The earth it remains. The fire, the water, and the air dissipate in. And um, so you could see how the element of earth is more. It seems to be more as an original state that's show, supposed to show how everything is connected and one comes from one source. So we have the power to introduce that into the world through, through meditating on this idea that there is this rhythm and that, and that all the polarities that create this rhythm, the black and white, the parchment and the ink, the wine that you look at in Shabbos is dark, it's supposed to be red. So you say that the, the things that you don't understand, that you can't penetrate, you can't see through it. White wine, you can see through it. Those things, I'm going to immerse myself.